every five minutes. And if you didn't, your code got reverted. And then at the end we had a discussion of the positives and the negatives and kind of got it on board with committing small and often. So we have zero walls offices, obviously we have walls around the outside, but internally um, it's, it's open. So this allows uh, continuous communication between people, and so people can just talk across the office. It's great for fast feedback, so if you can just go up to someone and say, I was working on this, why isn't it working? He can tell you right there and then. And it also promotes cross-team learning in that uh, if two people are talking, then other people can actually hear the conversation and say, oh, we were doing that today, and so pick up on those types of things. We have big desks and two keyboards, two mice per desk. So this allows for instant pairing if someone's got a problem or if someone, someone's bored, I can walk over to their desk and sit down with them. Uh, we can pair together. And the big desks encourage you to just take your laptop and put it on someone else's desk. And it just makes people more approachable. We also have standing desks. This is just personal choice for people. Uh, promotes mobility so they can move around. They can reckon it's healthier. And it's closer to the Xbox, really. There's only four controllers, so you've got to run. <laughs> so we also have remote workers. I work from Liverpool. Uh, Chappie sometimes works from Spain. And we have Berlin and London offices. So at first, we found continuous communication really difficult with remote workers. Then we remembered there's the internet. So we, have, we now have an online hip chat room where everyone can chat to you on the day. We have different rooms for the different offices and one main room where everyone can talk. Uh, we have webcams in every office, which is like a wormhole into the office, so you could literally just go up there and discuss something with someone from the other office. Uh, we do all our invites via calendar, and we have a uh, shared drive and shared space. We're trying to look into remote pair programming, something like Android Studio mixed with Google Docs, so you can have multiple cases. If anyone's got any ideas around that, you can I hope come and grab us, because that would be great to talk about. And, um... Silent offices are really boring, right? So we have this thing, it's HAL 9000, it's basically a bot on the chat. And it's connected to the ju jukebox, so you can do things like control the music with just, you know, ha um, turning him on, on the chat. So at the moment, we advocate for the hacker spirit. So this is things that people do at lunchtime, or like, you know, they, they show it in hacking tells. And this really helps um, building a great um, uh, working environment. So another example is the CI alarm. So we've got this this um, yellow light, and when the CI <coughs> when the, when any bill goes red, then it starts flashing, and this gives everyone visibility of you know something happened, just fix it. And for example, you can also ping it on the chat so that people from Berlin can tell us, hey, just you know I'm here, I'm trying to try to t trying to tell you something. Um, and yeah, as Paul said, we've got Xbox time. So this is really a great thing because sometimes you, you know, you, it's not all about working, but also when you're working, you, you get stuck in a problem, you don't know how to solve it, you cannot think of a proper solution. Well, sometimes the solution is just step away from the code, um, you know, think of something completely different, like, you know, kill people in Halo or something. <laughs> and, and then when you come back, you're like, oh, yeah, this is the solution, I found it. Um, and we also encourage everyone going to the pub. So this helps, but this helps on building good relationships between between people, because you, you end up discussing things that you would, wouldn't normally talk about at work. And you know you, you've got different opportunities. You can go before a, or when, when you release the app, or when you updated the version, or when there is someone's birthday, or just because it's Thursday. You know you can you can do whatever whenever you want and. You, you end up having these crazy ideas that sometimes are great, sometimes are not great, but you know, you can decide. And all of this we, we've talked about doesn't work if you don't hire um, the great people that, that, that are great for you in the end. You know, it depends on what you're trying to build. Um, you, you don't have to just judge people on their skill set. You cannot just hire this guy because he's a super hacker and knows all the things. Because you, you want people that can communicate with other people really easily, or you want people that you know that will will help building this environment, or that will go. If, you know, if we we try to think if, if you wouldn't bear with this guy for the whole day, or if you wouldn't go for beer with him, maybe it's not best fit for you. So make sure you you hire people that will help building this um, culture. 
Um, yeah, so now you've got your application done, you've, you, you've, you've implemented all the features, ship it, right? Well, not really. You, you still want to get features, you still want to get like, all the downloads and get all the money. <laughs> all that. Um, so we're going to try to explain this more, the, the last steps to, to, to get it completely right. So we're going to talk about this extra 5% that actually takes 95% um, of your time. So you know, implementing your feature is really easy. Something it's all about programming logic, and that's it. But um, you still you still don't want to crash, right? You you want to have have a great app that offers a great user experience, so that enchant users and wow them and all that, so that they will keep coming back and use your app and rate it, and it really makes a difference. So for example, get off the main thread. Don't do anything, any long running operation on the main thread. You've got um, tools to help you, but you know, it's something you, you this is the, the, first, the first thing you, you need to learn on Android. So for example, you can use strict mode. So if you use the one on the right, on the right it's the developer options where it will flash the screen when, when you're doing something on the main thread. But you can also do it programmatically, which is this. And you can set it up to just print a log cut when you're doing something on the main thread, some I/O operation or network operation. But you can even set it up to crash, so that when you are trying your application, it will crash, and then you'll be like, "Oh, there's something on the main thread. Fix it." And by the way, if you use if you use our library no kills, you can do it with one line of code. Um, also, you want to have a really smooth user interface. You don't want your application to be janky. So one thing you can do is use the um, on-screen GPU profiling tool, and this will draw the, the green line, which is the 16 millisecond threshold. You always want to be um, under the green line, because that means you're going to have a, for example, if you've got, if you've got a, a scroll view, you're going to have a 16, uh, 60 um, frames per second scroll. But if you're not under the, the green line, you're going to have some jankiness. You can have really easy wins by invalidating less often if you don't need to, or using hardware layers, for example. And another another quick win you can have um, to optimize your layout is reduce overdraw, as Mark said. Um, so overdraw is drawing the same pixel more than once. When you're drawing, for example, this window background, then you put this view on top, and you cannot see the window background. Well, that doesn't make sense. You're wasting time there. Um, you can enable the developer options to show the overdraw on screen and just check your, win your view backgrounds and you'll have some easy wins there as well. Yes, yeah, so this is about um, adding some polish to your application so that when you ship it, it's ready and all the users love it. So now you want to enchant your users. Now you want to enchant your users. So we're coming with material design. Animations are the way forward, so that when people interact with the application, they actually know where they came from. So we're, we're advocating animate all the things. There's some features that you can add if you, if, if, if you want your users to enjoy your app, you want them to engage with it more, you want to be featured on the Play Store, you can add things like a widget. A widget's great for another entry point to your application. It's right on the user's home screen, reminds them that it's installed, and gives them another way to get into your application. It's Android Wear and Chromecast. These are things that the Google advocates really go for. If you have these, you're more likely to get featured on the Play Store. You can add daydreams and live wallpapers for other engagement points. And there's also um, polishing the app in the background. So it's not all user shiny features. If you add content providers, these can help you. Um, these abstract away the database, so you've got another layer on top. And they're also a great way to remove duplication and um, you can use them for live wallpapers and daydreams. It makes live wallpapers like so, so easy. Um, there's the sync adapter, so this will stop you from become, uh, coming in the naughty list of applications that use all your battery. And deep linking so that from Google searches people can dive straight to your application or other applications can jump straight to your content. So once you've got your application and, you, and you've got it on the Play Store, maybe you've got it in a beta group or closed beta, make sure you listen to the feedback and uh, do those changes and ship, ship another version, like the first talk saying, ship it and ship it again. Uh, your Play Store rating will benefit from this. People love it when you listen to them and, and iterate. The beta communities are great for this. 
Another way to get feedback on your app is to do it yourself, and this is with analytics or A-B, A-B testing. Uh, with analytics, you can find like the core user journeys and then concentrate your app around those so you know that they come this way through the app and everything else is superfluous. So you can optimize that journey for the user. A-B testing will kind of allow you to switch out two screens so that you know which one has the best conversion rate. There's also um, crash reporting tools, and we've used two of these in the past, which is Splunk, but when we were using it, it was called BugSense. Uh, this has a killer feature in that if you have a crash and fix it and ship a new version, uh, BugSense will pop up. If the person has the old app and it crashes, BugSense will pop a notification saying this is fixed in the new version, go download it. Crashlytics is another one, and its killer feature is if you have your app pro-guarded, um, it will automatically upload the ProGuard config files so that when you're looking at the stack traces, they're automatically deobfuscated for you. So there's different guidelines to follow. There's the guidelines of design, guidelines of, of your app listing, and the guidelines for user experience. If you follow all these, you, you'll have an amazing app. And this is the extra 5% that you really want to get involved with. So if you don't follow the design guidelines, you won't get featured on the Play Store. If you don't follow the app listing guidelines, your app will probably be disabled or removed from the Play Store. And if you don't follow the UX guidelines, your app's going to suck and you'll get one star ratings. So I've got some personal experience with this. I had a McDonald's uh, calorie counter application that I uploaded two years ago. I had to uh, update it the other day and um, I got an email from Google saying your keyword stuffing because I McDonald's written 25 times in the description, and then they made me remove McDonald's altogether. So now it's just called fast food calorie, which is sad. And also, I had a Google I.O. developer helper, which showed all the videos from Google I.O. in one app. And this year, Google released their own app that did this, and I magically got a cease and desist email, which was nice of them. One last thing, too, to help your team internally uh, is add a debug screen. So these can help the QA and the designer, they can set up the app into a specific scenario so that they can test and, and try and reproduce things uh, that they want to see. You can also have like a static back end instead of hitting the internet so that if you want to demo your application you can show it to stakeholders without the worry that you've got flaky internet. And if you want to have a great app, you also need a great build system. We, we've been using Gradle for more than one year now and you know it's been it's been great to be honest. You can do really powerful things. You've got lots of plugins there. You can you know you've got lots of things done for you. So go and use it because it's great. Um, so for example, with Reddit you can use build types. So this allows you to have different versions of the app really seamlessly. So for example, we usually have the debug version of the app while that that we use while we develop, and then we've got the QA versions QA version for the QA team. And then we've got the release one, which runs progress, for example. But this allows us to do things like disabling features. Or, for example, we can disable bug sense um, while we develop, because we don't want to um, report the crashes. We can have a key for bug sense for QA and a different key for release. And that way, you can separate the bugs, uh, the bugs that you fix um, from the, the ones that come from the QA team that you fix from the ones in the live version of the app. And have you had any, any problems with versioning? Because we've had many. For example, you can, you, we've had the QA team using the wrong version of the app or not knowing which, which version they're using. Or you know, if you release um, multiple APKs to the Play Store, or if, you, if you're releasing to other um, third-party um, application stores, in the end, if you don't use proper versioning, you're going to have issues there knowing which version you have to use at, at each time. So with Gradle, it's really easy. Um, we 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 recommend using um, the Git SHA of the latest commit message for its build in the version name, and then you can also do things like using the um, Jenkins build number uh, as part of the version code. So the commit SHA, um, the, the SHA of the last commit me message, will help understand your developer's team um, which. Um, what's that version that is using on, on a device. And then the, the CI um, or the Jenkins build number will help your QA team um, to know what features are built on that build because when, when they download it from the CI, they will see the list of the last like, few commits. And, um, and now we're gonna talk about 
some we're gonna show some opinionated bonus time. How much time do you have? Okay. And um, yeah, this is more like personal opinions and things we, we try to do, but you know, don't need to trust us. So yeah. So lately we've been working with the AOSP. You know, you go to the developer's website, you've got these nice guidelines on how you have to write your apps, how you have to deal with memory and all that. And then you see this, right? This is catching a lot of memory error. This thing, we, there's only twice in here, but this same thing, it's done three times in a class. Guess which class it is? It's the um, wallpaper manager of Android. The yeah, true. <laughs> and you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> why, why do they do this? Uh, I mean, they don't tell us to do that, right? Yes, it's what we're saying. The, the developer advocates show you the, the, the great way to do it, and then you take down AOSP, and it's the complete opposite. So what we're, what we're saying is, uh, the Android examples are great for understanding API usage and, and how the APIs work, but they are shocking for architecting and getting out. Like Mark was saying before, the code, the code, for examples, you know, is great for understanding how to use it, but it's not how you put it through an application. If you've ever tried to take two Android examples and put them on the same class, you'll know the mess that you get into. So, and about it, we've also noticed some rep repetition in what we do, and so we try and advocate the same things at the beginning of each project. This is some quick wins we try and approach for all our applications. We now do min SDK 15. If you don't, don't do me an SDK 15, don't talk to me. Uh, with min SDK 15, you get the activity lifecycle callbacks. These are great if you're um, writing a new library or if you want to just get away from the activity. So the idea is when you used to have like um, shell activity or another activity that you have to extend, if you extend one, you can't extend another, so then you have a chain of extended activities. You can now plug in the lifecycle callbacks so that you can get these callbacks to on create and on pause without actually having to extend the activity. So they're really good. Oh, yeah. um, you know you can stop your application from crashing like most, almost all the time. So there is this way. Um, you can use um, a um, code exception handler. So what we usually do is we use that only on Redis builds, and what, we, what, what this will do is, instead of just throwing an, an exception, it will call you back in that method there. So this allows you to recover from failures um, or, or you know, ignore some crashes that you wouldn't catch otherwise. Um, we don't recommend doing this in the main thread because it's really hard to recover from. So if, for example, your own create of, the, of a fragment crashes. You know, you, you just cannot recover from that. You're, you're screwed. But if you do it in a background thread, if you are connecting up to the internet, downloading something, and something happens that you didn't control, you don't, you, you, can't, you don't need to crash. You can just use a handler like this, and then you can send the bug report to you know crash analytics or bug sense or whatever you're using, and just say gracefully. Um, we try to use this pattern, um, new instance. This is a dependency injection pattern. So dependency injection is really great. It, it helps a lot. But um, using a framework, it's a bit of an overview, especially in Android. So what this allows you is to have the testability of um, having the dependencies on the constructor. But also, it, it removes the um, boilerplate with this uh, factory method. So this way, you don't need to have any um, framework or anything. And you still don't have all these boilerplate when you write code. Yeah, and then lastly, we try and do some hexagonal architecture, which is a Java pattern for splitting your domain away from the carrier of your domain. So basically, if you're interested in shopping, you'd have all your basket code and how to uh, shop in your domain object, which sits over here, and then you wrap it with Android. And so the Android becomes the ports where you have the screen, the, UI, the GUI, uh, Bluetooth, the different adapters, so that you can test your domain separately and, and keep that away, and then in an ideal situation, we grab that domain and move it to Windows Phone. 
So we hope that gives you some uh, insight into craftsmanship. Maybe you've got a better understanding. Uh, maybe these chairs make a bit more sense. Uh, we've covered a lot of topics, so catch us afterwards if you just want to ask us anything in more depth.